All right, well, this morning we're going to be looking at five verses of Galatians 6, verses 6 through 10. Again, the, the central idea here is we, we will reap what we sow. But the, the point for us and the point Paul makes be, is because that's true, let's not grow weary in well-doing, okay? Because we, we will reap, you know, if we do not grow weary. All right, so... Galatians 6, beginning in verse 6, this is what Paul writes. The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith or of the faith. Well, again, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning. Now, last week, remember, Paul told us that if we walk by the Spirit, and again, that means that we yield to that, that affection, that desire that He gives us for the good things, right things, righteous things, holy things, what God tells us in His Word, that it will produce certain things in us, okay? We will be able to bear the burdens that we cause each other by our sins. That was, you know, what He was referring to last week. And we will have the gentleness that we need to be able to restore each other in love, whether those sins are in the area of faith or practice. Now, the Spirit gives us this ability by working His nature within us. Remember how Paul said, if a brother is overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. Now, to be spiritual means to be like the Spirit. Okay, as we walk in His love, as we are guided by His Word, the Spirit is making us more like Him, and more specifically, like our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's not forget that you know, Jesus, as a man, experienced everything that we experience. And one thing the Bible tells us about Him was that He was anointed with the Spirit above measure, which means the things that he did, he did under the influence and control of the Spirit. So when Paul says we should walk by the Spirit, we need to remember that Jesus did exactly the same thing. And he was led by the Spirit to do only those things that please his Father. Now, why did Jesus give us the Holy Spirit? It's so that we too might do the same thing, so that ultimately we would reflect that same character, his character. As we walk by the Spirit, we become more like Him. So we saw how that applied to restoring others if we're led by the Spirit, if we're spiritual, okay? We will live by the right standard. We'll be doing the right things. You know, we really can't restore someone if we're doing the same things that they're doing, right? Uh, Jesus says we first have to take the log out of our own eye before we can take the speck out of our neighbor's eye. If we're spiritual, if we're walking by the Spirit, we'll have the necessary gentleness that we need to restore them. Okay, a harsh spirit is only going to make matters worse, but genuine love and concern for a brother or sister will much more likely open hearts, their hearts, to respond favorably. And then most importantly, Paul said, if we're spiritual, if we're being you know, led by the Spirit, we're walking by the Spirit, we'll be humble... And again, he was emphatic on this. We will see our own weaknesses. We will see our complete dependence upon Christ and His mercy. And we will know that it's only by His grace that we are not in that same situation, that we haven't fallen to that same sin. And we will be able to sympathize with them. Let's not forget that Jesus, one of the reasons He became a man, not the only reason, but one of the reasons He became a man, was that he might experience everything we experience, with the exception of sin and guilt, so that he might sympathize. He was tempted in all areas as we were with, yet without sin in order that he might be a sympathetic high priest. So 
we need to sense our own sin and our own dependence upon the Lord so that we'll be humbled and we can sympathize with those that we come to restore gently in the Lord. Now, this morning, Paul tells us something else that will be true of us if we walk by the Spirit. We will invest ourselves in His kingdom. Now, I want you to notice, okay, we will invest ourselves, okay? There's, there's more things we have to invest than just our money. Yeah, I, think, I think of some lyrics, you know, of, of a, a song that was written years ago by Keith Green, uh, to obey is better than sacrifice. I don't need your money. I want your life, okay? That, that was, he, he really put things very bluntly in, in, his, uh, in his songs, but they were reflecting biblical truth. Now, it's not that God doesn't want the money, it's, but some people say, I've given, and that's really all God expects. Now, he wants, he wants everything, doesn't he? So we will invest ourselves, everything that we are, in his kingdom, which includes the talents. You know, again, think of the parable of the talents which are indicative or representative of the resources that God gives to us. The natural and spiritual gifts, the time that He's given to us, the energy that He's given to us, and yes, the wealth that He has given to us, we will use these things for His work, for His glory. Now, I believe in verse 6, Paul tells us, first, we will invest in the work of the church. He writes in verse 6, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. And Paul also writes in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 13 through 14, do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple? And those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Now, what Paul is telling us here is that in the Old Testament system, God gave the tithes that He required of His people. He gave them to the Levites and to the, to the priests, as well as many of the sacrifices, in order to support them, because the work they did required all their time. They didn't have time to go out and make a living and do these things on the side. Well, Paul tells us in the same way that those who give themselves to full-time ministry of the gospel are to receive their living from the gospel. They are to be supported by God's people. Now, that includes not only those who minister in local churches, but also those who minister the gospel abroad. We need to think about full-time Christian workers. You know, missionaries wouldn't be able really to do very much on the field if they also had to take care of their needs. Let's, let's, you know, just imagine a, a married man and his, and his spouse and their family and all the responsibilities that that entails and then going out onto the field and, and having to work a full-time job and having to take care of your family. I mean, you're not gonna find a whole lot of time left to do the work of, of missions. Uh, you need support. And, you know, one, uh, prof well, one professor at the college I went to, he was talking about his own experience on the mission field. He went into a, a very primitive situation where he even had to have servants because everything was so primitive. They didn't have washing machines, you know. They didn't have a, a store you could go to. <laughs> it was pretty primitive. So these servants would do all the household work. They'd wash the clothes. They'd prepare the food because otherwise... Just taking care of your needs in that culture was a full-time job. So he was supported in, in, in a couple of different ways, okay? Now, they need to be supported so that they can devote themselves to reaching the loss for Christ. Now, what Paul is saying here, first of all, is if we're walking by the Spirit, if we're being led by the Spirit, we will set aside what the Lord has called us to set aside, the tithe, the tenth that he requires of us, and we will give it to him in order to meet this particular need. Now, secondly, we will invest ourselves in each other. I want to jump forward to, to number, or excuse me, to verse 10, because we're looking at how we can invest ourselves, and then we're going to see how we might do this uh, in the next point. He says in verse 10, so then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are the household of the faith. 
that we are not only to share with the one who teaches us, who ministers to us in the gospel, but we are to give to everyone and particularly to brothers and sisters. Now, Paul says that we also are investing in the kingdom of God when we do good to someone else. Good is a very broad word, isn't it? But it can be summarized um, in a very helpful way by the word love, because love is the good that God wants us to do. Jesus says in Matthew 19, 19, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says in Luke 6, 31, treat others the same way you want to, them to treat you. Okay, so here's the rule of thumb. Love them as you love yourself. Treat them as you want to be treated. But that is further unpacked. Jesus further unpacks that in the Ten Commandments, as we know, specifically the fifth through the tenth commandment, where we love and do good to each other when we do particular things. Respect our neighbor's authority. Protect their lives. Protect their purity, their possessions, and their reputations. Do you know that everything else that the Bible calls us to do is simply an application of those principles. Let me just give you one example. How are we to protect their lives? Well, don't murder them. That's one way, right? Don't injure them purposely. Um, but, you know, protect them if, if they're in danger. Um, clothe them if they're naked. Feed them if they're hungry. Now, again, remember that there's a lot of needs all around us, and we do need to be careful that we don't think that this is a commandment to enable people not to do for themselves what they can and should do for themselves. But the Lord says that we are to help those who are really in need. And by the way, there's another way we can protect them, by praying for them and by evangelizing them because we're not only to protect their bodies, we are to protect their souls. Now, Paul says we're especially to invest ourselves in each other, which means that we are to do these things for each other as well, although um, hopefully the evangelism is already taken care of, but we can, we can pray for one another. But we also need to worship together. We need to fellowship together. We need to encourage each other through our faith. And, of course, love each other. We need to pray for and visit each other uh, as the need arises. So let, let's think about, you know, the needs that, that are represented in the congregation and think about how we can perhaps enter into that situation and relieve some of that suffering. If we want a perfect example of this, how to do these things, you know where to go, right? Just need to look at how Jesus did these things in the Gospels. And remember that the Spirit is working to make us just like Him. Now, Paul says that we are to do this while we have opportunity. You know, when the Lord providentially provides those occasions, when He brings those needs to our attention, and we are able to do something about it. You know, that, that's always the thing, isn't it? We Maybe we become aware of a need, a legitimate need, and maybe we can do something about it, but we think, well, maybe somebody else will, and, and I, I don't really need to do that. Well, that's obviously not the way the, the Lord Jesus would think of it, right? If he saw the need and he could meet the need, he would take care of the need. We need to be the first in line, okay, and not the last in line. So while we have opportunity, do good to one another, particularly to those of the household of faith, and I think Paul also means by opportunity during the short time that we have here on earth because this is the only time, the only time in which these opportunities arise for us to be able to serve him in this way, which is why Paul writes this in Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16. Therefore, be careful how you walk, how you live, not as unwise men, but as wise making the most of your time, you know, buying up those opportunities because the days are evil. We only have so many of those opportunities that are presented to us on a day-by-day -day basis. We need to make the most of those opportunities to serve Him in His kingdom 
and for his glory. So, the Lord wants us to be investing ourselves, okay, in, in the work of the church, the work of the kingdom of heaven, and that takes place by investing in the work of the church, but also investing in our neighbor and in one another, strengthening one another, of course, and being the light to our neighbors and being the resources for the church's work. But now, thirdly, Paul gives to us motivation. You know, what is the motivation for what he's calling us to do here? Well, he says that our investments will yield dividends. Remember the parable of the talents? You know, you've, you were faithful in a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Paul writes in verse 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Now, that stands as a warning. But it also stands, of course, as a promise of blessing. It just depends on what you're sowing, right? Now, this is an agricultural image. The audience would be very familiar with this. You know, when you plant a cherry seed, what do you get? <laughs> you don't plant the seeds, but when you put the tree in, you could expect, you know, that you're going to grow cherries. And if you plant wheat, you're going to get wheat. You know, if you're going to uh, plant corn, you're going to get corn. Okay, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Well, this principle applies in all other areas as well, doesn't it? Including the areas that are spiritual. He says in verse 8, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now, I really think Paul is applying this in two different ways, and, and I think the first one is probably the one we all, most often think. And that is he's applying it to our spiritual condition. You know, garbage in, garbage out kind of thing, or good things in, good things out, right? Whatever you sow in your life, it's going to, you're going to reap in your life, okay? Which makes this a very important key to growth, spiritual growth, into Christ's image. If we sow to the flesh, which by, by, by which he means, you know, not, not our bodies, but our sinful corruption. If we do the things that strengthen our sinful corruption, which would be stay away from the means of grace, that's a negative thing we do that strengthens it, break God's laws, or we desire the things of the world and we pursue those things and we, we give in to those things, or perhaps, you know, more pointedly to Paul's point here, if we pursue justification by works, that's sowing to the flesh. He says we will reap corruption. That desire for sin within us will become stronger. And the more we're going to find ourselves thinking about those things, desiring those things, and giving into those things, the very things we hate as Christians. But he says if we sow to the Spirit, if we immerse ourselves in those things, the things that he uses to make us spiritually strong, you know, trusting Christ alone for our justification, using the means of grace, obeying His commandments, serving Him in building up His kingdom, investing ourselves in the kingdom of heaven, we will reap a greater or a stronger spirituality, a stronger desire for holiness, okay? And the more we have that, the more we will give ourselves to His cause. Remember what Paul said back in chapter 5, verse 16 in, in Galatians. If we walk by the Spirit, we will not carry out the desire of the flesh. What will we do? We'll carry out the desires of the Spirit. But what's also implied there is if we walk by the flesh, we won't carry out the desire of the Spirit, but we'll carry out the desires of the flesh. So his point here is we need to sow to the Spirit. Okay. We need to invest ourselves in these things, first of all, you know, again, the things that strengthen our spirituality, the Spirit's work in our hearts, so that we'll have the strength that we need, the spiritual strength to support or invest ourselves in God's work in the world. Okay, so sow to the Spirit, strengthen that desire so you'll be able to give yourselves more to the kingdom. And this brings us, I think, to the second application, which may be a little bit more veiled here. And that is this. If we sow to the flesh and our corrupt desires become stronger 
and we invest our gifts and our time and our energies and resources into the things of the world, if this is the practice, the pattern of our lives, Paul says we'll reap corruption, the word is actually destruction. And that fits better with the outcome of sowing to the Spirit, which is eternal life, because that's not what we'd expect to hear if we were thinking purely about how it influences us subjectively, right? We think, well, who sows to the Spirit will be more spiritual. Eternal life, well, corruption, spirituality, destruction, eternal life. You see the, the two things that are, I think, going on here. So this isn't just sowing, as it were, into our hearts the things that will make us spiritually stronger or weaker. He's also talking about the outcome of all these things. So if we sow to the flesh, we will reap destruction, damnation. But if we sow to the Spirit, which we will if we're true believers, of course, and our spiritual desires become stronger and we invest our gifts and our time and our energy and resources into advancing God's kingdom, he says we will reap eternal life. Now again, Paul said exactly the same thing in Romans 2, verses 5 through 8. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good for glory and honor and immortality, he will render or give eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. So basically, if we have the Spirit of God, you know, we will sow to the Spirit. Sadly, we'll still have that tendency to sow to the flesh. So Paul says, don't do that because that's going to reap corruption. Just sow to the Spirit as best you can by God's grace, and you will grow, right? But if you don't have the Spirit of God, you will sow to the flesh. That will just simply result in greater corruption and greater destruction. And so what do you think Paul's message is to us? In verse 9, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Sow to the Spirit, and so be enabled to invest in the kingdom and reap, of course, the end of that, which is eternal life. Now, there is one other thing that is implied in here, and we shouldn't miss it, and it's this, that Paul is telling us that we should not lose heart if we don't see results. Okay? I mean, doesn't it seem sometimes as though nothing comes from all of the efforts that we put into growing spiritually or advancing God's kingdom? I think if we're honest, we're going to have to say, yes, sometimes we can get discouraged. But Paul reminds us that these investments are going to pay dividends. They will. We will reap if we don't grow weary. Sometimes we grow weary and we leave off, and we can't do that. We will grow if we spend time with the Lord. We have to persevere. The kingdom will grow if we persevere in doing good and investing ourselves in the kingdom. And we will see the reward that God has promised us, which is eternal life, okay, entrance into the eternal kingdom. Let me just remind you as I close, we're not justified by doing good. What Paul is saying here is if we are justified, we will do good. He's simply reminding us that here that there's something we need to do if we want to see ourselves doing more, investing ourselves more in the kingdom of heaven. We must sow to the Spirit because we will reap what we sow. Well, may the Lord bless His Word to our hearing this morning. Let's uh, bow for a moment of prayer. And as we do, let's also uh, prepare to celebrate the Lord's table, where we can find, again, greater grace and help from the Holy Spirit to invest ourselves into God's kingdom.